<clears throat> so the question is, what is it? What is it? How does somebody um, partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily? <clears throat> I think the the answer to the question how is more important than even just looking at what Strong's defines the word as unworthily. And, and the best way to do that is what? Context, right? right. What does the context say? <clears throat> First Corinthians eleven twenty seven. 27, it says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of this, uh, this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And again... In verse 29, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine. now, he says, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. <clears throat> That's kind of a hint. Now, that word damnation in the New King James is translated judgment. <clears throat> and this is not to extract this from the text in any way, because I believe... He explains what that judgment is in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians. Do you guys remember that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is where he talks about how our your ministry, and all of us are ministers of the New, New, New Testament, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 elaborates on that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks about how we're all going to be, uh, our ministry, the quality of our ministry is going to be judged so uh, that's the judgment I think he's talking about here in chapter 11, verse 29. So we'll look at the context. Uh, by the way, don't forget what he talked about here where he said in chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, where he talked about not discerning what? Lord's body. Okay, just mark that in your mind. What does that mean? What does it mean when somebody who doesn't is not paying attention to the other members of the body of Christ? And particularly their needs, right? What does that mean? Got it? Okay. Okay, let's run with it. Okay. So back up here. Is that the Lord's body, the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. I'm with you then. So mm, stand by a second here. All right. Verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and, and verse 19. We'll go to King James here. Now this is a fascinating verse to me. We're, we're in the same context, right? Same chapter. Right. And the Holy Spirit here has Paul say, for there must all, be also heresies. There must be heresies among you. New King James says factions. Okay? Divisions. Right? Why must there be divisions in the body of Christ? We, we would like to think, well, that's not God's will. It's not God's will for there to be all these different denominations. But here, God in his sovereignty says, no, there must be. It's, it's necessary that there be divisions in the body of Christ. Why? Read the rest of the verse. That they which are approved may be manifest among you. Approved by God? Correct. Okay. Or recognized that they might stand out. Okay. And then we know that's going to be the case eventually when we all stand before Christ. And now he, he launches into the conversation about the Lord's Supper. He says, when you come together, therefore... So there's a connection here to the context. Right. Therefore, is there on account of what? Those those who are approved or those those who are um, not divisive, but those who are concentrating on building up the body of Christ um, are in one group. And then there's another group. And this other group, he says, is not they don't come together to eat the Lord's Supper. This other group among the Corinthians, they claimed that they were observing the Lord's Supper, but they really weren't. Well, what's the Lord's Supper? 
comedian, but more supper is the comedian. Right. But what they're having is Wednesday night supper. <laughs> well, look, let's take a look. For in eating, everyone eating, eating what? The, the supper, right? Everyone is taking before the others his own supper. And the others were hungry. Paul said, if you were hungry, you'd get home. So here you had the people who had means bringing their pot, their uh, crock pot, and eating out of their own crock pot. And they were not spooning any of it out to the other members of the body of Christ who were probably hungry. There's evidence that the early Christians who, especially Corinthians and Galatians and the Thessalonians, had quit their jobs in anticipation of this kingdom that was coming. And they were hungry now because the king, what happened? Well, re Israel rejected their king and the kingdom didn't come. And so now you had people who had quit their jobs, sold their houses, didn't have anything left because they'd given it all to the church. And now they're all hungry. You had other Christians coming to observe the Lord's Supper who had still had the means to bring their own food who were not sharing it with the hungry believers in their own assembly. So he says, that's why he says, you're, don't tell me that you're coming together to observe the Lord's Supper. Why? Well, what did Christ do? When he observed Passover the night before he was betrayed, what did he do? How did he do it? He broke the bread. Right. And did he start chowing down on it like I did on the chips a minute ago? No. No, he things. He, and then, then what did he do with it? And he passed it out. So it wasn't that. He, don't no. miss that point. Okay. Exactly. What were you going to say? Wasn't that after they had had a meal? That yeah, that's, that's beside the point, though. Okay. What did he do? With the bread. He broke it, he blessed it, and then he gave. Very symbolic of how he what? Gave of himself. Right. He was the bread of life. And so he used that as a pattern to share. You them, do you understand what I've done for you? Thank you. So that's the pattern for the Lord's Supper is sharing, right? But what were the Corinthians doing? They were keeping all the food that they were bringing to themselves. And keeping enough wine to get drunk, right? Another evidently, drunk. yeah, evidently. Right. So you're hoarding the food. And he says, hoarding. what? He says, don't you have houses to, to stuff your face in? If you're going to stuff your face, then do that at home. But when you come together, don't despise the, the, the other members of the body of Christ who don't have the means to feed them, themselves. He, and you sure you're putting them to shame because imagine that they're sitting there at the table with other with other all of all of them are gathered around the tables and some of them have food to eat and others don't and the ones that have food to eat are sitting there stuffing their own faces look what he says here he says you're shaming those people who have not and what they were doing was shameful. And he says, for I, for I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And what did he do? When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, take of this, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Do it. Do what? Give of yourself. After the same manner, he took the cup. And when he supped, Saying, this cup is the New Testament, my blood, this do ye as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do you show the Lord's death till he comes. The cup of what? It's not talking about the substance. See, the Catholics, bless their heart, think that it's the substance. That's why they call it transubstantiation. They think it's the, it's the substance of the elements that matters. No. It is the it is the giving. It's the sharing. You know, he wasn't talking about a ceremony. He was talking about a, a manner of life. 
where you where you are willing to spend and to be spent for other members of the body of Christ, isn't it? Yeah. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, well, how are they doing it unworthily? Holy. Thank you. They were right. I mean, you want to you want to see a good example of hoarding? Just take a look at my man purse. Look at that. That's hoarding. That's what they were doing. Now, now in today's life churches, where they admonish people, if you if you got if you got issues, you shouldn't take communion. Now, what, what does that mean? What are they getting now there? What does that even mean? No, well, that's been, they're taking this verse out of the context. They're they're thinking unworthily, like if you have sin in your life, then you can't. You're not worthy. You and what what does that even mean? Right. The connotation is is that some Christians don't have a sin nature. <laughs> Well, yeah, we all have sin. We, we, we or all are still sinning. Or you could do like I had one guy tell us in, in uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. Now, I'm not saying anything against Campus Crusade for Christ, but I can tell you that one of their founding, one of the founders of the Campus Crusade for Christ said um, his answer to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 would be this. Get a sheet of paper blank sheet of paper and write down all sins that you can remember and confess them before the Lord asking the Lord to forgive you of them and then you can partake the Lord's supper what's what's wrong with that qualifying grace that's what's wrong with it's qu- it's qualifying grace yes. yep. that grace is the grace not only that but my sheet of paper wasn't big enough right but that's beside the point. But the other, what's the other problem with that? Well, if all I had to do was ask God to forgive me in order for his forgiveness to be accomplished in my life, then why did Christ have to die? Well, he's already forgiven. He's not, Thank you. It's not that, we, not that we're getting new forgiveness. No, the reason people, right. That's a good point. The reason it's people not cheap forgiveness. You know, that's the other thing. It's not like because to me, then what's the difference? Then this is where here comes where all religions are the same. Then what's the difference between believing in Allah who's merciful, as it's said, or believing in Christ who's merciful? Either or I just have to ask for forgiveness, then I'm forgiven, right? I mean that's the that's the real <laughs> message inside the message where and so you completely lose sight of the cross and all the work that Christ did on the cross and before that, right? And you make it cheap. Because to me then, every day you, I have to come back, and I, and you know I've had this discussion with that brother I told you about, right? Where you got to keep the commandments until you sin, and then you come to Christ for grace again. So then, I told, like I told, I told you like I told him. So then every day we're just going to re-crucify Christ. That's what you're doing, because apparently it's cheap grace. It wasn't good enough to, to help you get through this day and it won't be good enough to get you through the next day and you, so you have to constantly come back and crucify Christ so we, it's more self-focused than it is Christ-focused in the, at the end of the day right? well, what's that verse in Romans that we talked about several months ago um, that while we are yet sinning what's that Romans 1-8 oh yeah right? it's still it's, present it's still in present tense yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's uh, Romans 5 8. Yep. It's not like we were sinners, we are yet sinners. Yeah, right? yeah. The, the King James is uh, in the, in the uh, it, it, it sounds like it's in the past tense in the King James, but if you bring up, this is Romans 5 8. Um, yeah, great point, Bill, that uh, if, you, if you notice here, online Bible software uh, next to the word were there's a word that's in like the greater uh, less than or greater than symbol there the 5607 and then to the right of that there's a 5752 which is in parentheses it's those numbers that are in parentheses that if you click on them uh, will give you the parsing of that word And notice here that it's in the present tense. And it's a participle. What is a participle? 
Always remember this. A participle always ends in ing. Ing. So still sinning is the point here. While we are still, while we still have a sin nature. So you could read, you could reword it like while we are yet sinners. Yes. While we, while we still have a sin nature, you know, satanics people would, would really throw this around because, you know, literally when you say we were yet, the, the yet makes the word present. Mm-hmm. The, if we if we left the yet out there, while we were sinners, we're not anymore. Mm-hmm. No, while we were yet mm-hmm. sinners, so you could almost replace the word sure. with are. Sure, we are still sinners. In fact, maybe some other translations. Well, they're the paraphrases. Anybody who's honest, you know, they they don't have to know the Greek to know that there's they still have a sin nature. Right. Right. And in fact, verse ten is in the present tense. Also, there's there is still a part of us that is an enemy of God. Right. The flesh. Thank you. And we still battle with the flesh. But it's That's what we were talking about before. But, but but he's he starts out in Romans chapter five by saying what he says uh, we glory in tribulations. Well, let me ask you a question: Is the sin nature does that cause trouble in your life? Okay, now think that. Just hold on to that thought. And let's go back to verses eight and ten. Okay. We glory or we benefit by virtue of the fact that we know that there's a part of us that is an enemy of God and still falls short of the glory of God. How do we benefit from that? Because every time we fall short, we are reminded of what? His love. His love. Amen. Now does that, he had to start chapter 6 right out by saying, does that mean we should purpose to go sin? No. No. Dummy, who would do that anyway? I mean, we don't. You don't have to purpose. It. You don't have to put a purpose on it. It's going to happen anyway. Well, but there's a there's a little cliche too that we don't have to teach children to sin. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> no one taught the two year old to lie. <laughs> I know it's a bizarre, kind of a mind-shifting concept to think that failure in my life can actually draw me closer to Him. Well, even even in this secular perspective, we learn more from our mistakes yeah. than we do from our successes. In fact, in some cases, the more grievous our mistakes are the bigger the lesson and the more of an impact the lesson is. You know, y'all have been. Not that we want to go out and screw up this recovery. Right. No, but you know what means has a deeper and deeper meaning to me is the is the Proverbs verse that though a, a righteous man falls seven times, he, he rises again. You know, and and uh <clears throat> Gets me choked up just thinking about it, and it <clears throat> it's it's um it's like a it's like a concrete foundation of my peace to know that I can't screw it up, right? No matter no matter how bad it is, I can't mess it up, and so it gives me the strength to get up and just. You know, I think the most powerful point is that um, I just forgive myself. It's, it's just a daily routine until it's just second nature. Do you know what I mean? Where I don't have to return to like fundamental stuff. It's just like, just forget about it, move on. And there's where the peace comes in that I'm not dwelling on self-condemnation, you know, because I, I'm not dwelling on this mistake I made over and over and over again. I'm just over it and I just move on. You know, it's the and there there's the it's the piece of the thread in there. So, so yeah. now the Catholics have a hang up on the 
Saturday night confessions too. Right. That they believe that they're going to get forgiven when they go to confession. If they confess it, they're going to get their forgiveness. So, and I can attest to this. What's gonna What's gonna help you move on in a peaceful, in a, in a peace of mind way? Either are you confessing every week? Is that going to help you? Stay tall again. The the though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Is confession going to help you rise again, or is forgiving yourself going to help you rise again? And you know what I mean. And to me, understanding that our grace is not cheap grace is the that's the that's the cornerstone of it. Are you looking for that verse? And that's the other thing in the Catholic system that, that bugs me is their Hail Marys. There it is. What's the yeah. purpose of the repeating? And the, I mean, even in the regular Mass, they go through. Some of them do. I mean, you get, there's, uh, it, it's not just the Catholics. I mean, they're, at least they're kind of honest about the fact that you have to do something. They think you have to do something. All the time. Uh, because that shows God how earnest you are, or whatever, and um, and that God would therefore be more inclined to show mercy toward you. That's the way they think. And it, but it's not for it's not exclusive to Catholics. No. It's the flesh. Right. It's yeah. how the flesh thinks. Yeah. Um, in in every one of us, if we're honest, we're going to say that we there's a part of us that that appeals to. Right, because um, it's pride that comes out of that. Um, how could God forgive us? I can't, you know, I deserve to be punished for that, right? So punish me. I, I mean, I, I think that's what it's all about. Well, go ahead, I got that coming. Beat me or kill me or whatever. Yeah. Imprison me. You know, all of that stuff is just pride driven. Meanwhile, God says, hey, it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. Yeah. So here's a. Uh, and here's a good, here's a, I'm studying now this week. This is the doxology at the end of chapter 11, Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments mm-hmm. and his past. His ways, now. his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor right. and who has First given to him, and it shall be recompensed or repaid unto him again. For of him, through him, and to him are all things. Mm-hmm. To whom be glory forever. Mm-hmm. Those, those four words. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, like, who are we to tell God how to use his wisdom and knowledge? And <laughs> but we think we can. Right. Yeah, that's what it's like. Again, who has been his counselor? Right. <laughs> his ways are hard. I say it, I think. My thoughts are. Not your thoughts. Is that like Isaiah 60 or something? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to have a real mm-hmm. interesting challenge in one of our questions in this week's study. The Here's, question, I don't have a verbatim, but the Isaiah question 55 was, versus what 89. reason did God create the universe? Can any of you answer that? For what reason did God create the universe? Well, I, can you, can I don't you have answer the answer, but I know the... Yeah. Mm-hmm. The reason? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, I, I stumbled on that because I went right back to 34, verse 34 is, who knows the mind of... How can I determine why God did this? I mean, <clears throat> the old cliche of... Because he could. <laughs> I'm curious to see what the scripture says about that. Yeah, I, I, I went, and they had a whole list of references, and I went through all the references, and none of the, none of the references answered that question. So well, the, the context of Romans 11, 33, um, kind of explains, actually, all of chapters 9, 10, and 11, right. explain that it culminates in this, Conclusion here is that God has concluded all, not only the the Gentiles, but even all of Israel in right. un, in, in unbelief. That's who the them is there right. in Israel, and in the in the way that the prophets 
had portrayed Israel was that the Gentiles could not have been blessed apart from the rise of Israel. So if Israel was concluded in unbelief and the rest of us are in, in a world of hurt, as far as prophecy is concerned, right? Right. Um, uh, but Paul here is not talking about prophecy, is he? Um, he says in um, Romans eleven thirty two, is it? Um, no, that's not it. Um, verse 25 he says I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be coming and that's, the, that's the other question too until the fullness of the Gentiles there's a lot of people earnestly thinking that that means to where we have sent missionaries to mm. every part of the world that we've and we share the gospel with everybody. The fullness of the Gentile is a decision of God. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, it's his decision. And do we know when that fullness is? Mm -mm. No. Not at all. So what do you say? Other places? The thief in the night? Yeah. yeah. All we know is that it hasn't happened yet. And it will, and, but that <laughs> it will happen. Exactly. And that's, we can rest that it will happen. When? It's not for us to do It could be that cashier you gave a Bible card to. It right. could be the last one. <laughs> okay, so uh, God does explain that. But they, does that answer the question? Because the question is, you know, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been His counselor? Uh, there are things that man assumes that he can, he can persuade God, Right? That's why he's asked the question, who has been his counselor? Right. Uh, I mean, I have, there are people that have, that have come into my acquaintance that absolutely believe that we can change God's mind. Pray they, people in the heaven and all that stuff. They right? don't believe in the immutability of God. They don't, and it's, it's, it all boils down to the fact that they don't believe that God has concluded all in unbelief. Why? Because all unbelieved. Everyone has said, I don't believe in, in you, God. And, and the second part of that is that God is therefore within his rights to cast everyone into the lake of fire. Right. Well, they, they can't reconcile all that. It doesn't seem fair to them. So they have to resort to believing that God is not immutable and that he doesn't have perfect foreknowledge. They have to resort to that because... To, otherwise, they, they can't reconcile the two. And so, uh, but God has revealed certain things, not the least of which is this mystery that he says. Right. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant of this mystery, which later he, sa he says is the essence of the wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his ways and his wisdom past finding out. But there are things about his wisdom that he has revealed. Otherwise, he wouldn't say what? I wouldn't have you to be ignorant. Right. Why would he say, on the one hand, I don't, God doesn't want us to be ignorant. And then on the other hand, say his ways are unsearchable. How do you reconcile the two? Right. How can you search something that's unsearchable so that you're not ignorant anymore. I guess my problem with the question is the wording of the question, because part of the wording of the question is, for what reason did God create the universe? Who asked the question? This is in the Bible study guidelines, the questions. For Bible study fellowship? Yeah. It's, it's part of our questions for this week. You can reword that, which doesn't help me in is why did God create the universe? Mm -hmm. Well, do we know why? Yes, we do. He's revealed it through the mystery. He revealed it. Okay. Help me out. With up, and, up until the mystery was revealed, however, the only thing that God explained about his reason for creating the earth was so that he could give it to an Israel for an inheritance. When the, now that the mystery's been revealed, 
he explains that now it was God's eternal purpose to do what? To fill all things, including the entire universe with with who? The, the sons of God. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Romans chapter eight, uh, Book of Ephesians. So, that's, so that's what we can we can conclude through all the other mysteries that that would be the reason was to fill it with and to give grace to all. To give an inherit is it to give his entire creation as an inheritance to the body of Christ that he might fill all things that because we're we're members of the body of Christ and it's God's desire to to for that Christ be the heir of what the whole creation the whole creation that's Romans 8 okay. yeah so maybe uh yeah, I, I was just hung up on it because it was to me it was asking me to determine why God does anything. Some of some of we we don't know. Yeah, there are things that are we won't know uh, why God does them or why God allows them until we get to be with Him in glory. Um, is God within His rights to allow some schmuck to go and shoot up a, a school in Florida? Uh, so I don't know how many people died. Seventeen the last count I heard. I don't know how many injuries. That uh, God have mercy. But is God within His rights to allow that to happen so that one life can be changed? Yes. And what is it that Chuck told us that God? Well, you said it before, didn't you? That God will sometimes allow things that he hates in order to accomplish things that he loves? Right. Well, well, this is, the, well, this is the general concept of why does God allow suffering without getting into specifics? Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of my, what, what God impressed on me was when we have people suffering, whether they're believers or not, when we have people in our society suffering, that is an opportunity for other people to learn and to practice compassion. Mm -hmm. That if God didn't allow any suffering, where would where could we practice the compassion? Mm -hmm. Now, That's a good point. Some people mm -hmm. believe that God allows suffering because the sufferers earned it. <laughs> right. Well, then we all deserve it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I, I, I can't go along with that. Father, just uh, thank you for the good fellowship we have here and, and the fact that we can, um, that your spirit enables us to uh, have the liberty to, to share um, things that weigh on us, you know, even sometimes with tears. And uh, we just praise your name, Lord, for the work that you're doing and um, uh, in the lives of those that we care about and we thank you lord that you um, promise that you are going to meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory in christ we thank you also lord that every knee you said every knee shall bow and every tongue confess and so um, for that reason lord just ask that we would exercise mercy toward those who um, will will may and may never uh, voluntarily bend knee and acknowledge you um, but, but that one day they may be forced to um, and we just ask Lord that we would help that we would remember the mercy that you've extended toward us and that so that we can be gentle toward others we just thank you for the impressions that you've made in our lives I, uh, the lives of these men here and I ask Lord that you would help them to uh, uh, communicate that and and, uh, and to be able to do so effectively and doesn't have to be eloquent but it does, does need to be spoken and uh, even as you've said we believe and therefore we speak pray for journey mercies Lord and those who uh, couldn't make it and uh, and those who are listening who are not present that uh, 
you would help them to understand the, all spiritual blessings that you've given us on account of the blood of Christ and that you would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. The eyes of their understanding would be enlightened that they might know what is the hope, the hope of your calling and the inheritance that you've given us in Christ. Pray, Father, for strength for the remainder of the week and the, and the week to come that we would have the courage to um, do the things that we ought to do and the strength to do the things that we ought to do and the, and the grace to accept the things that we don't and that we can't change, that we can't do, and the wisdom to know the difference. We ask these things on account of your strength and your power and your grace and your wisdom. In Christ's name, thanksgiving, amen.